Hi guys, so um, this is going to be a Renee Rants video. Also just, I, 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 yeah, uh, it's, I'm going to make it in relation to books as much as I can, rather than just being a really generalised topic, um, because I know that most people are probably just here to hear me talk about books, but I feel I need to just get this out of my system. You might wonder why I rant so often, and I think it's honestly because in, um, just in my day-to-day -day life and in my relationships with people, I really hate conflict. I'm not good at it. If people get mad at me, I don't tell them off. I don't shout back at them. I usually go really quiet and then find, find some space to go and cry. So that's my means of coping because I don't like conflict. And even though I recognize that it probably will solve a lot more things if I argue back a bit sometimes, I don't like to engage in it. I'm not someone who likes yelling. It's just not my thing. So I have an awful lot of aggression stored up within me from the years worth of keeping all this locked down. So I think a lot of the time rants for me are just very um, cathartic. <laughs> so that's why I like engaging in them in this relatively harmless fashion by talking to a video video camera. So um, please do forgive me for all my ranting. But I know a lot of you tend to find it entertaining. This one won't be nearly as entertaining, I don't think, simply because it is about quite a serious topic. But it's been bothering me because I'm currently reading Kate uh, Forsythe's Bitter Greens. And I'm over halfway through it. Wow. And uh, it's a, a historical fantasy fairy tale fiction book. Um, much more historical, really, than all the other things. But there's fantasy in it and there's fairy tale illusions because it's sort of a Rapunzel retelling, sort of. Um, but yes, it, it's a, t a novel that contains three female protagonists, and we're skipping back and forth through time to deal with each of them and their story. And. Um, it's very good. I'm, en I'm enjoying it. I am enjoying it. It's it's well written and it's very engaging and it's quite addictive. And I keep going th with it. And I, I like I like the stories that are being crafted. Um, but I'm having a really hard time with it because uh, it's uh, two out of the three protagonists that we deal with and a lot of other supporting characters are females and they're courtesans slash prostitutes. So one of the pervading I don't know if it's themes, but a lot of the content is associated with sexual violence. There's a great deal of rape, there's a lot of threats of, of just um, of sexual abuse, um, and it's hanging over a lot of the content of the book, simply because of the time period we're like dealing with like, around the um, 15th and 16th centuries. Hold on, is that right? No, the 16th and 17th centuries, I always get that wrong, um, in Italy and in France. So you can understand context-wise the fact that this kind of stuff would be occurring. And that that is also the thing that's upsetting me. It's not just the fact that it's part of the narrative, but it's the fact that this all has historical resonance and sadly still resonance today. This kind of shit happens. And that's always the thing that really gets to me when I'm reading about this sort of content in books. Um, and it's not that it's... I'm not arguing... Uh, its merit in being, uh, you know, included within these, within stories. Um, just like anything that occurs in life, of course, it needs to be discussed and um, and displayed and um, pondered on. Um, and I, yeah, I, I don't take issue with it being in the story. It's just that I have a very difficult time encountering it. And like animal rights issues. I seem to get excessively, violently, really emotionally charged with anger and hurt when I come across these things. For example, if I see like a discussion of uh, like, uh, animal abuse on the news, like a news report about it, I will get so <laughs> I will get so mad. I will start shaking. I'll be shaking with like suppressed rage, and I'll probably start crying. And my mum will have to tell me, Renee, just leave the room, or go out, go out into the balcony and get some fresh air or something, because I want to punch walls. Like I have this overwhelming sudden desire to punch walls. I feel the same way when I encounter sexual violence. If that's on the news, or if I hear reports about it, just from other people, like, I start shaking, and I'm so, so, so angry. And I don't know what accounts for this. I'd like to think it's just because I'm a human being, and I have a soul, and some semblance of a moral code, and so I, I'd like to think that everybody should be as enraged by this kind of stuff as I get, but other people don't seem to feel this way, or n not nearly as strongly, and so I always feel very strange and very weird and like a freak because I get so upset about it. Um, this was this is the main reason why I've never done a review on Game of Thrones. I watched season one of Game of Thrones, and I've got the first novel, um, and I will read it at some point. Um, <coughs> but 
uh, I really struggled, really struggled to get through season one of Game of Thrones. I would um, have to stop a lot of the time because I watched it. Um, my dad downloaded it on the internet, so I just watched it on DVD. Um, yeah on a USB thing. And so I was able to stop or pause or fast forward when I needed to, and I did that a great deal. Because almost every single episode I was struggling to think, okay, just get just get through it and just keep watching it. Because it wasn't that it wasn't a really compelling story, of course it is, and there's a vast cast of characters who are all very interesting and stuff. And it was engaging, and I kept wanting to go through with it for the narrative side of things, but because there is so much um, violence and so much rape in that story, um, and for me, as, as harrowing as it can be to encounter stuff on a page, like written content that's really difficult to get through, a visual medium is that much more um, uh, hard and in your face and tough for me. So seeing rape on a page is bad enough, but seeing it on film, seeing it in a play is really, really difficult. So I struggled to not throw my remote through my television screen every single time I watched a Game of Thrones episode. And it lingered with me, that was the thing as well, like I'd watch them, usually late at night, like I'd watch them in bed, and then I wouldn't sleep. I wouldn't sleep. I'd get maybe one or two hours of sleep, and that was the case last night when I was reading Bitter Greens, when I finally put it down at like something ridiculous like 3am, because <laughs> I kept reading it, but I was horrified, but I kept reading, and when I finally put it down I had to leave the light on and just lie there, because I just couldn't sleep. And so Game of Thrones was awful. Um, I mean, I really still cared about a lot of characters, but the stuff that goes on in that freaking story, oh my god, and knowing that it's it's... Like, you tell yourself, oh, it's just fiction, Renee. It's not really happening. These are just characters and it's just a story. But knowing that that actually, that still goes on. And it's just, the, like, this overpowering sense that I, I, I'm getting it whilst reading this book and I was certainly getting it while watching season one of Game of Thrones. Um, the idea of any time you would see a female on her own or in a situation where there, w there was just her versus an awful lot of guys. You knew what was about to happen. And that's the same with this book. Any time there's a female character who's like walking down a street or something and all around her there's lots of blokes, automatically I'm just like, warning, 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 get the hell out of there, get the hell out of there. And this is the thing, that should not be the fracking case. Even in, like, in my city, in Newcastle, there's a park um, that's renowned for being a bad place to be if you're a girl and it's night time. Do not go to that park because you will get raped. And I think there were like, I heard of five instances of this happening last year, and that was just the ones I heard about. And I don't know why they happened, I don't know how they happened, I don't know the details of any of it, but it happens. And just the notion that, like, say you'll be leaving a pub or you'll be leaving wherever the hell you are, a theatre in Newcastle, and you just want to go from the theatre to your car and you're with some friends, and if there's a guy friend with you, he'll always say, Oh, um, I'll, I'll walk with you to your car. And even though you think, oh, that's silly, you know, oh, it's probably better if you do, I guess. Just the very fact that we feel this this um, threat is insane. I don't understand it. I don't understand this. And I'm really generalizing here. I know that plenty of rape occurs to men as well, so I'm not trying to just blame it all on the males. Um, but this idea that men somehow feel this need to sexually threaten and abuse and harm women I don't understand it, and I never will, and we probably shouldn't because it's batshit crazy. Oh my god, I'm so mad now. Um, but, I, yeah, I think, for example, throughout Bitter Greens, there's the idea of, of purity, um, like uh, young girls and, and purity, virgin blood, that kind of thing, because it feeds into the witchcraft element of the story, and the idea that um, the witch, in the main witch in the novel is always seeking pure blood because and she has to look to very young girls because in the city of Venice at the time, um, for the most part, once you got to the age of 12, by that time you were either already sexually active or very soon to be sexually active. That was just the reality of the situation. And even that notion of the fact that this char these characters are walking around and noticing um, there's like distinct um, suburbs of Venice at that time where it was all just uh, like a community based around prostitution and they were seeing child, young girl prostitutes everywhere and that was just what was going on. And just even the, like the, the fact that that was the case and it's still the case in so, man, so many developing countries and stuff as well, 
um, and probably in the underbelly of developing countries too, we just don't like to acknowledge it. That, the mere fact that these things exist is just baffles my mind and makes me sick to my stomach because I can't understand it. I think because I've grown up with such a very negative view of sex for the most part, and there's a variety of reasons as to that, but these things, like even just what I encounter in fiction, does nothing to help me view sex as being like something that could be A-OK -okay at some point. I just, it perpetuates my really, really negative association with it because of the violence, because of the stereotypes, because of the 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 shame that goes with it, the hypocrisy, like the fact that you often encounter in novels, especially period, like historical novels, um, men, like the men in the story will be pointing fingers and accusing these women of being whores and, and, and whatnot, and yet, of course, they are the ones going to them for sex, like, you know, profiteering them for, for sexual favours and stuff. So it's like the hypocrisy of it that's never addressed or acknowledged. So I'm, I just thought I would just make mention of the, um, the fiction that I've encountered where there's been um, sexual abuse and I've really struggled with it. I would love for other people to, you know, let's, let's discuss this horrible, horrible topic and, and bring up books where we've had a hard time. Like, for example, I've still not yet read the first in the Song of Fire and Ice series, um, mainly because whenever I was on Facebook complaining about how hard it was to get through season one of the show, everyone was telling me, Puh, wait till you read the books, they're that much worse. I'm like, great, that's, that's a good reason for me to pick them up, but I thought I'd just at least put this in my collection so I could say it's there. The Millennium Trilogy by Stieg Larsson, like the girl of... The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo and all her books, um, I know those were at least partly inspired by the fact that Stieg Larsson had witnessed a rape and done nothing when he was a teenager, and that guilt lingered with him throughout his life, and that they were at least partly why he went and wrote that series. I've not read the books, mainly because I don't know how I'd go with them. I've not seen the films either. Again, don't know how I'd go with them. I know some friends who saw, like, the American adaptation, film adaptation, and had to leave, had to go walk out while the rape scene was going on. And that would be me too. Um... So yeah, the Millennium Trilogy, certainly Ovid, <laughs> my gosh, if you're thinking, oh, Renee, you know, you don't need to worry about these things, and anyway, it's all ancient history, but ancient history, certainly, in these myths, these, the Greek gods, all they bloody do is rape people. Zeus was an expert rapist, my god, that man could serve like several centuries of a life sentence if he was alive today. Um, one book I've still not read because I'm... While I want to because it got so much cr like criticism and yet praise for its really dark content, and it is a fairy tale story, I don't know how I'm going to go with it, but I have Margot Lennigan's Tender Morsels, but I've not yet been brave enough to pick it up. I mean, the book opens with gang rape. I just don't know how I'm going to go. I just don't know. Um, Room by Emma Donoghue. Again, not yet read it, but I mean, it's a Stockholm Syndrome capti captive situation, and she's birthed a son because of the guy who stole her, so... There's that. Um, even though many people won't classify this as rape, that's the other thing, is the way in which society and subsequently society within these novels perceive rape, because I'm going to try and find the video that Melina mentioned. Um, I think it's the, a book called The Purity Myth, and it discusses the idea of everybody has this very idealised notion of what rape is, and if you don't fit into that definition, then it's not classed as rape. So... I mean, within this book, a lot of the time, the rape that's occurring is um, between a customer and a prostitute. Does that count as rape? Of course it freaking does. You say no, and that sex continues. That's rape. That's just the deal. But, I mean, for instance, that's why probably a lot of people won't classify what goes on in Impossible by Nancy Whelan as rape. But it totally is. Dear God. Um, um, Ink Exchange by Melissa Ma, the second book in the Wicked Lovely series. She wrote this book with one of her central reasons being that it, she is a rape survivor, Melissa Ma is, and so she wanted this to sort of be her catharsis and her exploration of that, and it's a book that kind of, even though rape itself is referred to um, in real terms, it's a book that uses magic and fairy law and the, the, the um, politics of the dark court of fairies to examine rape in a metaphorical way, so that's that. Um, historical books are filled with rape. Sarah Waters Fingersmith, there's stuff in there, not nice. Of course, the other Boleyn girl. That's one of the reasons why, when I watched the um, 
film version of this, I got up and left and went to the toilet for a little bit <laughs> and lingered there so I didn't have to go back in. And also me trying to watch the Tudors. <laughs> really bad idea. I think I got through four or five episodes before I finally just couldn't take it anymore. And that's why I've not yet watched season two of Game of Thrones. I've w I watched, I think I watched four episodes. Five? I don't know. It got up to where San it was the episode where Sansa was getting attacked. And then um, the Hound came in and rescued him. Thank God. Um, but yeah, by then I was just like, I can't watch this anymore. It is doing nothing to help my emotions and all it's doing is making me mad. I cannot watch this anymore. So maybe I will try and watch season two at some point, but I don't know. Um, Atonement, a book in which rape is part of the back, like a subplot in it, but it's still certainly there and it brings up a lot of interesting questions um, with regards to what happens later in the book, what is revealed later in the book regarding some characters and stuff, so that's an interesting one. But they're just ones I pulled off my shelves. Um, of course sexual violence doesn't always pertain to rape, there's um, a myriad of things going on there. This is a horrible thing to talk about, but it was just bothering me, it was upsetting me whilst I was reading the book. I really hope it's not going to mar my old overall enjoyment of the novel because I was very excited to read it because I've heard nothing but great things. And it's my first Kate Forsyth book as well, and she's a really well-known and praised Australian fantasy author, so I want to read more of her stuff. And I want to finish the book. I'm 301 pages in to a 500 and something. 540 something novel. So I want to keep going, I want to finish it. Um, because I care about the characters and it's, it's like very interesting plot points going on and stuff that I'm just really struggling with some of the content. And I was just wondering, do you guys get as upset as I do? Have there been books you've really struggled with because of this, um, this issue? Yeah, just wanted to say I really had to rant about it because it was upsetting me. So um, I'm going to keep trying to read this and hopefully finish it soon and give you a review that doesn't just focus on how much I got sad. <laughs> so yeah, that's just me ranting, really random, upsetting, depressing topic. Yeah. Hi, just remembered some books that I really wanted to mention in my discussion of sexual violence in fiction. Um, uh, I should say that certainly it's a pervading theme in a lot of fairy tales. I mean, I think it's the central basis around things like Red Riding Hood and um, Bluebeard, Bluebeard especially, and Angela Carter did a really effective um, uh, adaptation and retelling of that in The Bloody Chamber. But two classics I remembered. One of the most obvious ones ever, Tess of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy. Bloody fracking depressing story, it's so sad, but so much of it is based around Tessa's experience with Alex and whether or not that was, I classify it as rape, but I mean it's because it's glossed over in this book it's difficult to really define what actually happened, but most of the films have taken it being rape and, and, and solidified that idea. Um, but so much of it, it her, <laughs> the awfulness of her life is based around the weight and burden of carrying all the consequences that have resulted as a fact that she was sexually abused. And so that just pervades all the other um, stuff that goes on in her life and hangs over her like a cloud. So it's a very interesting examination of that. And in, in a way it's sort of um, kind of um, examining slut shaming as well. To an extent and without knowing it was doing that I don't think. But um, yeah, so Tess the Durbeville certainly, certainly. And then Tenet of Wildfell Hall by Anne Bronte, which contains something that I think a lot of people don't like to address. There is, I think, statistics around saying that at least, at least half of reported and unreported instances of rape and sexual abuse occur within marriages. And that's certainly something you can find in Tenet of Wildfell Hall. And that's something I think a lot of people like to ignore. Again, it's the notion of what the idealised rape victim is. So, um, yeah, certainly two classics I just remembered to, to mention there, so just wanted to make sure I included them.